Uh, hello and welcome to the Dank Christian Memes podcast. Uh, if you don't already know, Dank Christian Memes is a place for all kinds of Christians and all kinds of non-Christians to enjoy memes and fellowship together and also this podcast. Uh, I am your host, Brocklin. I'm also the digital minister and one of the moderators here for Dank Christian Memes. I'm joined by Jacob, another one of our moderators and our uh, resident archaeologist, as well as Andrew. Andrew, what, what should we what should we make your title? How, how, how would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I don't know, Re uh, resident divinity student and Catholic. I don't know, something like that. I believe I called you our Catholic authority last time, but I don't know if that's like a loaded term that's gonna gonna make you look a little more <laughs> severe than you are. What maybe, is authority? Maybe we should in the say Catholic Church, Andrew. <laughs> maybe we <laughs> should say Catholic you? scholar because authority makes it Catholic sense. scholar. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We don't want to get you in trouble. Uh, right. So uh, our Catholic scholar. So, uh, Jacob, do you want to start us off a little bit? And I feel like, especially those of us who are fond of Indiana Jones and, and those movies, that it's really easy to, to not make a distinction between something that is considered an artifact, an archaeological artifact, and something that's considered a sacred relic. So can you give us a, like, a bit of an academic's perspective on that difference? Yeah, so... We don't really use the term relic as an archaeological term. Uh, it's a cultural term that is applied, that re refers to an applied value by a people to an object, right? So um, an artifact has a very specific archaeological de definition, which is that it is a mobile object that is created or shaped by humans. So for instance, um, a spear point would be an artifact, a foreshadowing very good. Cup would be an artifact, right? Uh, these, these might be relics too, but these would be artifacts. So would, um, a necklace or, uh, a, a spoon or whatnot. Something... Am I correct in assuming that a lot of um, artifacts turn out to be somewhat mundane where we'd expect a, a relic to, to maybe have a story and a little more pizzazz behind it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also important here to define things that aren't artifacts. Um, the two other like classes of archeological remains that things can be put under are ecofacts and features. And an ecofact is something that has, um, it's not made by humans. It is an, a natural object that is found in relation to uh, a human site, such as like bones from a slaughtered animal or something. Um, and a feature is an immobile object. So like a wall or um, a table that's part of a structure. It's something I'm thinking of the wailing wall. Like it's an incredibly valuable, but it, it's immobile. It's not, it's not going anywhere. And if it does, it ceases to be what it is. Right. It's it's the difference there between an artifact and a feature is that someone can move an artifact around uh, in different places, presumably without damaging or destroying it or using heavy labor, whereas a feature is intended to exist in a single spot um, and it it has to continue to exist there. Right. Or else it's destroyed. Um, a relic in the sense of i'm trying to think of when we would use the term in an archaeological field it probably would not be in relation to the object itself as we find it it would be in relation to uh the culture itself so a culture might treat some object as a relic if they imbue it with a sort of sacred association um but that's beyond our typology. That's into uh, our interpretation of materials, right? And how we interpret the culture's use of them through context and how we understand them, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'd say it's a higher level of analysis required to call something a relic because you have to you have to presumably have some inference in the perspective of the people you're discussing. Which I guess, you know, 
uh, certain civilizations we just don't have that much information on so it'd be very difficult to to make such a determination whereas you know something in the christian world we we have a, a base of knowledge on that uh so andrew do you want to explain to us a little bit about you know relics as, as someone inside the catholic church as our our catholic scholar and then once we've sort of like covered the different angles uh i'd love for you guys to chat about uh potting through religion uh before we we actually dig into our our relics of the day yeah um relic is a is a somewhat complicated term i would say it's most basic definition is it's an it's a um, religious object that's associated with a holy person. Um, many of them are going to be artifacts, and many of them are going to be, I think Jacob called it ecofax. So many of them you will see will be either an object that belonged to a holy person, or, or at least is claimed to have belonged to a holy person, or is a body part of a holy person. So examples of that might be, um, the, a really famous example might be like pieces of the cross, which is obviously associated with Jesus and would theoretically be an artifact. Um, but you might also have like the bodies of saints. So a lot of saints that are really important, their physical bodies entombed are considered to be relics. Um, that is the most basic understanding of relic. And so those are called first and second class relics in the Catholic understanding. A first class relic would be a part, a physical part of a saint, of a holy person. And then a second class relic would be an object owned by them, associated with them. And then there's also what's called a third class relic. Um, and this really comes about, especially with like pilgrimage to the Holy Land becoming a thing and the Crusades. And that is an object, usually a piece of cloth that has been touched to another holy object. So like um, an example of a third class relic would be like a piece of cloth that was like touched to the body of um, like St. John the Baptist, for instance. Um, so that's kind of the Catholic understanding of relics is those three classes. Um, and if I had to kind of draw a distinction line between an artifact and a relic, I would say that a relic is a type of artifact or ecofact that has a significance for a religious group, has a certain holiness to it. Um, obviously, I'm most familiar with it within the Catholic context, but relics exist across both Christian denominations and across a variety of religious uh, practices. So, yeah, that's kind of my overarching definitions of relic. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead, but I want to talk a little bit about authenticity and who, if anyone, is in charge of authenticity uh, from a Catholic perspective. Like, do we see the sort of hierarchy of the church making judgment calls on these relics or are um, are we really seeing local communities, you know, they lift up what they lift up and that's, you know, just, you know, kind of uh, accepted as as legitimate because it's, you know, not really a problem for anyone outside that local community. Uh, is there a, a sort of litmus test or is it sort of a, you know, what is sacred to you is, is, is okay? Yeah. So within the Catholic church, there is um, an authentication process that relics can go through. Obviously more modern relics is a lot easier, right? It's very easy for a bishop to kind of vouch and say, yeah, no, this is this is this body of this holy person, or this is, you know, an object that belonged to this holy person. Um, but there is a formal process through the Vatican that one can go through. Um, and there actually is a group of nuns in Rome, and I forget their organization's name right now, but um, there's a group of nuns who they're essentially, their ministry is that they prepare and authenticate relics. So Theoretically, any Catholic relic comes with a piece of like Vatican approved paperwork um, that's produced by these nuns associated with the Vatican. And it will be essentially like an authentication certificate that will say this is what this relic is and it'll describe it. And it'll say like this is who it is. And 
essentially to the best of our knowledge and understanding, this is in fact a relic of this person. Um, that is a more modern invention of the Vatican. Um, so obviously the older a relic is, the less likely you are to have that sort of paperwork. There's a lot of relics and things that are just assumed to be authentic because they've been that way for a long time. Um, some of which we can deduce are, you know, pretty likely. Um, for instance, I'm thinking of the, um, uh, the relics of Teresa of Avila and the relics of, uh, there's another one, I can't remember her name right now, but um, who their orders have been the stewards of that person's things and bodies since their time of death. So you can be pretty assured that the, you know, the coffin actually has the body of that saint in it. Um, but th there's a lot like relics of the cross that are kind of, you know, there's there's no way to prove that this little piece of wood is actually a relic of the cross of Jesus. Yeah, so I want to, you know, be sure to talk about the authenticity factor when we go over some of our relics. But I also, you know, want to be careful not to be disrespectful to anyone who who finds any of these these relics to be, you know, sacred and and inspirational. Obviously, I'd never want to pull that out from under one. So I'll just, you know, remind everyone that I'm, I am, you know, Protestant, so a little, you know, a little ignorant in this territory. But before we move on to the artifacts and relics themselves, um, do you guys want to talk a little bit about potting through religion and potting through history, which, in my opinion, uh, I've been listening to and have been really great stories that happen to be historically accurate. There's there's, there's a lot of stories being, you know, uh, shared on podcasts, uh, but I feel like you guys are, are doing something that's, you know, a little bit of a, a cut above the rest. Um, and I appreciate that. And I, I'm sure your other listeners do as well. Uh, can you tell us more about how, how you approach potting through religion and potting through history? Yeah. Uh, so um, it's actually potting through time, not potting through history, but I it is so sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, uh, yeah. So me and another friend who is Evan on potting through time uh, have had a uh, very irregularly published uh, history variety show podcast for a while. And then Andrew, who is one of my old friends from school, um, so we go way back, uh, like this idea and basically said we should do a religion one together. And so we decided to just have an associated uh, religion podcast. And so they both, they're both uploaded separately, but they have a lot of um, crossover and shared community and whatnot. And I think uh, Andrew can probably uh, tell a lot more of his perspective on it as well. But I've, um, I've had fun making having our dynamic uh sort of illuminate topics that we both like but often from different angles because i tend to be more into the into the history and um like cultural development of a lot of religious topics whereas andrew provides a theological lens that i only grasp on the surface level sometimes well, and I feel like both of those kind of approaches are are hard to find in the podcasting world, especially being present together. Um, so you know, I I hope your other listeners and and those who might discover you know find these podcasts to be as unique and valuable as as I do. Yeah, that's um, definitely our goal. I think that so I was obviously inspired by um, potting through time. And I came to Jacob and said, hey, you know, I think it would be fun for us to do something that looked at the intersection of theology and uh, religion. Um, both of us have very academic mindsets. Um, we're both in higher ed in relation to our various fields. So um, we thought, let's just do a podcast and try to look at that intersection, because that's a lot of our conversation and bonding over the years has been around the ways in which these interests um, intersect. We both have an interest in history and we both have an interest in religious studies, um, but his is definitely a stronger interest in history and mine is certainly a stronger interest in theology. Um, and so we thought it would be really interesting to bring those together in a way that was rather academic. I think there's a lot of really good religion podcasts out there from the perspective of 
people talking about their faith and their religion. Um, and that's great. And that fills one kind of segment of academia. But we didn't feel like there was a ton that was addressing the more academic side. So um, we've tried to do that in our podcast. Um, our podcast is very just conversational. Uh, it mimics the kinds of conversations Jake and I have. So we pick one topic, like we recently just recorded one on the Bhagavad Gita, um, which is a text we're both interested in. And we just brought the historical and theological lenses to it that we have and just had a discussion. Um, we don't really have any aims of a particular episode other than to just kind of discuss what we think is interesting and important. Um, so yeah, it's it's been really fun. I think too, one thing I appreciate about Jacob, and I hope he appreciates about me too, um, is the academic aspect is really important for us. Um, both of us coming from the world of academia have a certain amount of like reputation on stake. So we need to make sure that we're, you know, not saying wild things in our podcast. Um, but we also want to make sure we're not saying it in such a way that's so academic, it's unapproachable. Uh, so yeah, we just try to, you know, have a little discussion about a topic and try to invite you in um, and just try to look at both the, what I would say are the normative or kind of the theological judgment aspects and then the descriptive, the historical aspects of a particular religious topic. Well, thank you both for continually bringing your expertise and, and your your zeal for, for academics to the Dan Christian Memes podcast. Uh, we are sort of the bottom, feed, bottom feeders of what you guys have already created. Uh, so thank you so much for, for being supportive here on top of uh, the projects that you're already working on. Uh, I thought I would start with my first relic, uh, which will probably not be the best storytelling ever. And then you guys can jump in and, and correct anything or, or add anything I've missed. Uh, and then we can you know, go on to the relics that, that you guys are thinking about. Uh, does that sound good? That sounds good to yeah. me. Sounds great. All right. So I figured that I would start with the Spear of Longinus, sometimes called the, the Spear of Destiny. Um, it's got It's got some other names. It I thought it was a good pick because it actually appears in one of the Gospels. Um, in the Gospel of John, there is a moment where I guess they're trying to determine whether or not Jesus is dead or not. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, this was sort of a, a known, known thing in the execution world. If you stab someone in the side uh, and you know they, they expelled both blood and, and what looked like water, that you could, you could tell that they, they were then dead. I, I'm not sure if that's actually true or just what they believed at the time. So the spear was really important as indicating Christ's death. And it's doing some theological lifting because it was not unusual for people to have their legs broken during crucifixion, I guess, as a method of, of hastening death. Um, so because Jesus is resurrected bodily, um, this this spear is is making sure no his legs weren't broken so when he was resurrected bodily he could walk but he also had um, you know a, a wound from the the spear on on his side um, so you know obviously I, I feel like in the case of a lot of these relics what makes finding them so special is that they'd gone lost that this spear in, until it had been used to you know pierce the side of of the crucified Lord. Um, wasn't particularly remarkable, and we don't know thereafter if if it would have been. But it was eventually claimed to be discovered by someone fighting in the Crusades, and I feel like this speaks to sort of the power of relics in in some cases, where you know whether or not that was true. This person held up a spear and said, "This is this is the spear of destiny. This is the spear that pierced our crucified Lord, and this is the spear that's going to lead us." To victory, uh, that there was a, almost a sort of political power in having or claiming the sacred artifact uh, that that crusaders might want to take advantage of. Um, so that's my butchering of the story. Uh, do you guys want to jump in and and correct anything? I know I've glossed over many many details. Yeah, I think one of my favorite things about uh, what I know about the Spear of Destiny in in its involvement in the First Crusade is that. It was actually found and then discredited. I don't remember the the details of on everyone's name precisely, but there was a figure who um, 
was it Bishop Adam? No, it was a challenger, I think, to the the official papal legate that was supposed to lead the the crusade. Um, supposedly found it digging in a ditch, pulled out this chunk of iron that was a spearhead, and like this was once you controlled this, this was a symbol of authority, right? And then, uh, and it's a spearhead, right? Because yeah. in most cases, like the the part the elongated part that you'd hold on to would be made out of wood and likely would wouldn't survive right right it was like a it was the the head of the spear i think only and if i remember right eventually this gets challenged its legitimacy gets challenged and they have basically monks who have who claim that through the power of the spear they'll be able to survive uh being on fire and then that doesn't work out and like the spear is discredited and its political power like dissipates. Um, and well, I was... always thought it was kind of a strange thing. Like this pierced the side of our Lord at the time of his death. And now it is a symbol of, of power. Like, uh, like I, I, I understand what makes it sacred. I don't understand what, what makes it powerful in the eyes of those who, who felt that. I think there's just so this is this is my like cynical perspective i guess i think that when when you're talking about people in in the crusades you're talking about a group of people who self-selected as very very exceptionally concerned with the sacred and its role in the physical world um obviously they are performing a an armed pilgrimage. Uh, and so they're attaching, um, a lot of value to military arms and, uh, specific places in a way that, you know, we, we probably don't do in casual religion that often. So I think that the type of people who would sign up for something like the crusades were just sort of, um, a focus group that's a little more interested yeah, self-selected be the sort of people who would follow around a a spear connected to Jesus, right? Well, Andrew, let me ask you, is is the sort of sacredness that the spear of Longinus would have, does it come because it came in contact with Christ's body and blood? Uh, or is there something different from, from the Catholic perspective that would make this uh, important? Yeah, so uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, not to, that was a terrible crucifixion pun that I did not mean. But, um, <laughs> um, but yes, I think it is because the spear was part of the crucifixion. Um, and there's anything associated with the crucifixion has a certain, because that is, that is the most central act of Christ in the Bible, right? Probably like the most central act of Christianity is the crucifixion. So anything that is thought to be directly tied to that has a important holy presence. So the nails, the wood of the cross, the spear that pierced his side, all of these things are seen as essentially like that, and maybe like the Holy Grail are considered to be like, you know, the most sacred of relics, right? Because they are these things, these items that participated in the actions that are the culmination of our faith and the most important part of the biblical story. So in the middle ages, when you have this like group of like highly spiritual people seeing themselves on this holy conquest of the land, items like the spear take on a huge presence, partly because they're objects of, extremely sacred devotion but then also i think there is a certain idea or understanding that the one who possesses these has power and authority in the same way that like when the ark of the covenant was being paraded around through the you know years in the desert that that was kind of like the showing of God's favor and like the, you know, it's like if you have the ark, then like, you know, God's going to have favor on you. I think there was a certain idea that like he who possessed the spear or he who possessed the crown of thorns or, you know, 
would have certain favor with God because, and certain like kind of blessings upon him because he, he was kind of the, the caretaker of this relic. Um, now, let me get, let me ask a bit of a question here. Now we've talked a little bit about how, you know, um, many of these relic stories revolve around, you know, crusaders. Um, is it possible that, you know, these people who are living a pretty violent life, at least in some instances, uh, are, are look that the, the idea that they could gain God's favor after, after perhaps being violent and making some bad calls uh, is an attractive thing to them. Uh, whereas, you know, I, I might think the rosary might be a little more traditional path <laughs> to gaining God's, God's favor and, and having a better connection with God. Um, do, do you think there's sort of a, a cultural um, uh, interest in a, in a special, you know, sort of salvation that these relics might provide? Yeah, I think they are very tied up in the, like, holy war theology of the time. Um, that there is this understanding that one of the ways you can gain glory for God and therefore, like, favor with God among yourself is to li- is to live a life where you are fighting a holy war. You know, so if you're reconquering the Holy Land, you're reconquering Jerusalem in the name of Christ, in the name of God, then even though you had to kill a bunch of people in the process, because you're doing such a good and holy thing as a result, it's kind of like a sanctified violence. Um, there's certainly a lot of a lot of commentators now in academia will draw parallels between um, the conquest of Israel found in like Joshua and the Crusades. Um, there's a lot of postulating that the there was kind of an identification with the people of Israel. Um, with the crusaders and so they're like well if god had favor with these people and blessed them to go and conquer in his name you know jerusalem and the land of israel then he will do the same for us and And we do see quite a bit of that in the old testament right but that is somewhat you know theologically consistent with with certain parts of the bible yeah which makes it an extremely attractive theology for this group of people and i think as a result then the various relics of the holy land and of the passion are important, right? Like you're going to see among crusaders a different um, emphasis on relics, right? They're not going to be as interested in the relics of holy monks and nuns in Italy and Spain. They're going to be more interested in the relics of the Passion, the relics of Holy Week. You know, they're going to be interested in the things that can be tied to the various miracles and life of Jesus, because it's about retaking the Holy Land for Christianity. Yeah, so it, you know these things are definitely tied up in the sort of political aspirations um, of the day. So it, that that was you know what I wanted to pull away from the spear of Longinus that when you know someone found it or thought they had found it, it wasn't just that ah I have God's favor. It's ah I have God's favor to now go it and do you know X Y or Z. Um, what, what's uh, what else do you guys have on our our relic list our our reliquary agenda uh andrew do you want to go first or do you want me to go with my wacky biblical relic um well i was going to just go with some like classic ones so maybe i'll start with a couple and then you can we can go down the wild path because there's good there's certainly some wild relics out there um so i want to kind of pick an older so we we talked a little bit about how there's a lot of different relics related to um saints and to the early church that can't be verified um so yeah so there's there's certainly a ton of those so i'd just like to touch on a few others right you have the nails of the crucifix the crown of thorns um fun fact the crown of thorns is said to be held at notre dame cathedral in paris um so if you ever go there you can Uh-oh. see it they have um, is it safe from the fire? There. <laughs> right. Yeah. So literally, there was a priest that ran into the cathedral and like brought out the crown of thorns because he wanted to make sure he didn't get destroyed. But trust me, my me and several of my Catholic friends were like, we need to figure out if this got saved because I feel like it has to get saved. Um, yeah. So it was one of the many things saved during the fire was the crown of thorns. Well, uh, that's great was, to know. Yeah, it was in a vault in the basement, so it wasn't like super in danger, but yeah. Remember, Um, folks, keep your relics in a fireproof safe. Yeah, exactly. Um, So uh, there's kind of a whole cloud 
of, of relics around that sort of stuff, many of which are now um, due to the Crusades in the Middle Ages and who had the money and a whole kind of power struggle of trying to get relics from one another. There's either several different versions or if, um, of relics, or if there's only one, there's only one, but they tend to be held in very prominent cities and churches. Um, the Viennese have a lot of relics um, associated with like the crucifixion and the passion and things like that, because the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was very heavily Catholic, had the money to um, buy up these relics, um, the French as well. But I think one that's particularly interesting, there's quite Is a that few... allowed to buy and sell relics? Like for so, money? In the modern day, it's not. Um, in the modern day, it's not. There's there's very strict canon laws of the church against it. Um, but there was a time when, yes, you would say, hey, you know, King so-and-so, if you have this relic and you need money for your crusade, let's do a swap. I'll give you this much money and you give me that relic. So there was this, there was effectively purchasing relics at one point. Um, but it's it's very, very was there a tourism component to this that certainly that... um certainly and that's definitely so like one of my my favorite relic facts is that if you were to add up all of the pieces of the true cross or that claim to be part of the true cross of christ um your cross would end up being like 200 feet tall so there's clearly <laughs> evidence of that at some point there were people just you know selling relics making money off of it claiming this piece of wood is part of the cross of christ when it's just some piece of wood that they found. Um, but I think one uh, really interesting relic that's a first-class relic that's important for the Catholic Church is the bones of St. Peter. Um, and I think that's that's an interesting one to bring up. So as most of you know, um, you know, Peter was the considered to be the first bishop of Rome. And St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is said to be built upon the site of his burial. Um, and so for a very long time... That sounds rude up front. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure it's meant in a dignified way, but to build yes. something on top of your burial seems, yeah, so at, there, at least at first, to be rude. In, in, defense, a... of, in defense of the construction, if you ever go to uh, St. Peter's Basilica... It is gorgeous. It is legitimately one of the prettiest buildings you'll ever see. Uh, but also, he's not the only pope down there. There's like a bunch of them. Um, yeah. So most popes are buried under the Vatican now um, and in St. Peter's. Um, so actually, recently, when we just buried um, our uh, um, John, not John Paul, um, Benedict, Benedict. XVI, he was buried in the crypt. So there's actually several levels of crypt because there's like the crypt in the Vatican like in St. Peter's. And then there's a even further down crypt. That's an ancient Christian burial ground um, and that the Vatican is built on top of that supposedly has the bones of St. Peter in it. Um, and you can actually, it's apparently really hard to get tours, but um, you can sign up for tours of the ancient crypt. And I've heard it's quite phenomenal if you're able to get the tour, but obviously it's a very, that sounds thing. legitimately awesome. No matter yeah, what your beliefs are, that sounds really, really cool. Yeah, It's on my bucket list. Um, so down there, there's, well, one of the, one of the burial sites, and this is very common for saints to have, important saints to have churches built upon their burial grounds. Um, but so supposedly the high altar, so if you ever look at a picture of St. Peter's, um, the really big altar with the giant canopy made of like stone and metal and all that stuff in the center of the church is supposedly built upon the top of the tomb of St. Peter. Um, and there have been, over the years, archaeological digs, and they have found a tomb that, on the front, had a carving that, I forget the exact words, but said something translated from Latin to something like, here lies Peter. Um, and so the bones found in it are believed by the church to be the bones of St. Peter. Um, and so obviously, those are highly important um, relics both for the theopolitical positioning of the Pope and then also for Christendom, Christendom as, as in general, right? Because it's, it's claimed to well, be the bones also, of the apostles. 
isn't the, the the quote from the Bible, you are the rock upon which I shall build my church. So like, we're, yes. you've taken that to, to a pretty literal place at this point. Oh, yeah. No, and there's um, one of my favorite depictions of Peter um, is him holding a, like, in one hand, he's holding the keys because, like, he's considered, you know, God gave him the key, or Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom, right? So that's that's a symbol. But he's holding the two keys to the kingdom in one hand. And then the other hand, he's literally holding like a scale model of St. Peter's Basilica because he's quite literally the rock upon which the church was built, um, yeah. which is kind of fun. But so obviously these bones are heavily important for the church um, and they are now in a beautiful little ornate box um, and they're kept there under the altar in like a smaller chapel. Um, but every so often they are brought out and venerated on his feast day. Um, and I believe, I forget when, maybe it was in 2000 and like something, I don't know. There's some major anniversary that they actually like allowed the public to, to view the bones. And that was a big deal. Um, I would imagine that coming up soon here for the 2000th anniversary, the founding of the church, they'll probably do that again. But, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly an interesting um, one and it has strong both reverence as part of one of the bodies of a saint and as of an apostle, kind of the the prince of the apostles, as my particular church gives him the honorific. But then also for the papacy itself has a strong political um, presence. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's they've done a few studies and they've generally concluded that like. The bones are probably from a male from probably about the age that, you know, Peter died. So, like, as far as St. Relics go, they probably have the best case for being authentic. But we don't have his DNA on file. So that, that's about right. as close as it gets, like, right? Yeah, these bones are about 2,000 years old and they're from about a middle-aged man. So probably. Um, yeah, so I think that's a particularly interesting one. Um, and then just one other one I'll mention, and this will maybe help transition into um, uh, Jacob's Stranger Ones. And this, in, uh, when Infinity War came out, this kind of was a thing for a minute, for a hot minute. Um, so on the I do topic, love me a good Marvel reference. Yeah, on, to stay on the topic of body parts of saints, and again, not all relics are. But one is the Hand of Teresa of Avila. Um, and what's particularly interesting about the Hand of Teresa of Avila, so for those of you who don't know, Teresa of Avila was a Carmelite nun and Spanish mystic in the 1500s um, who wrote a very famous book called Interior Castle um, that's all about the interior spiritual life. Um, was she martyred, or am I thinking of someone different? You're thinking of someone different. She died of old age. Oh, good for her. Yeah. Um, and so she's interesting. Um, there's also a very famous statue of her um, that I think is a Brunini statue in Rome that's supposedly depicting like her in a state of ecstasy and like prayer. Um, that's somewhat controversial because um, this is a family show, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it PG, but um, of her. In a, in, a, in a heightened state of pleasure, and we'll leave it at that. Um, tastefully so, done. Tastefully done. Um, but what's interesting about, so obviously she's this important Spanish mystic, so uh, her bones and her relics are um, venerated, and like many relics of the high Middle Ages, they were encased in gold and bejeweled, um, so the hand of Teresa of Avila is wearing five different stone colored rings and oh in goodness. the center back of the palm is a window for you to see into the golden casing. Um, so when infinity, um, when, uh, infinity war came out, there was this meme going around for a while that the infinity gauntlet has existed all along. Um, and it's been owned by the Catholic Church and specifically the Carmelites um, that take care of the relics of Teresa of Avila. Um, so that was a fun little moment of pop culture and um, religion meeting. But I think her hand is a good example of a relic that 
predates kind of the paperwork era of um, authentication of relics, but is without a doubt her hand because she died. Her Carmelite sisters buried her in a tomb. She was then later um, declared a saint. Her body was dug up and her hand was put on display. Um, the bones of her hand, I should say, were put on display and venerated. So even though there's no like official Vatican, yes, this is Teresa. Um, it's there's no historical doubt that this is this is her. It's body. a well monitored case. Yes, um, and now, obviously with more more modern saints, um, like say John Paul II, you would have uh, when his relics would just be approved by the Vatican and they'd do the paperwork. They now, did you say the bones were cast in gold, like 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 covered in in gold, like yeah, I might imagine? So, so if you look up like trees of Avila hand, you'll see it. Um, and actually, the first image is comparing it to the Infinity Gauntlet. But it's essentially a cast gold hand. Um, and this is very common for a lot of relics of the high Middle Ages, where they will encase whatever body part or item in a piece of gold that looks like the item. And then there'll be a small window that will actually let you look at the relic itself. Um, That's so, really yeah. interesting. Yeah, those are a couple that I think um, are interesting. And obviously her relics are venerated globally. Um, throughout the Catholic, she's a very important Catholic mystic and monastic. So, both among the Carmelites and among Catholic mystics and monastics, she's a very important saint. So, yeah, those are a couple of my relics. And uh, over to you, Jacob. Yeah, what you got for us, Jacob? So, I wanted to talk about uh, a, a famous artifact from the temple and its wacky history, the temple in Jerusalem. But everyone talks about the Ark of the Covenant, and I think there is one with a more interesting history, and that is uh, that of the menorah. Um, so for those who aren't, no. who aren't familiar with um, the, the temple in Jerusalem, according to, uh, I think it's, it's somewhere in the Torah where it talks about the first, the, the like design for the temple, but uh, supposedly during the, the temple artifacts themselves date back to the Exodus and were created for the tabernacle. Um, historians generally generally argue that they were probably uh, actually made several times and that they probably, the entire history of the temple probably didn't use the same artifacts because, you know, they would have gotten pretty worn out. Um, but uh, there was this, ancient candle structure that we call the menorah now which was uh, basically basically a seven uh pointed candle now if you're wondering about like hanukkah menorahs and hanukiot um as they're as they're properly called uh and why they have two more candles that is to accommodate the specific use in the holiday the original temple menorah would have had seven candles specifically um so we have two categories of menorah one that would be specific to a Hanukkah style celebration and the other would be more day to day uh, for lack of a better term. Would you say? Uh, I would say it would be more of the specific menorah from the temple. Um, gotcha. The thing is that like uh, Hanukkah has eight nights, right? And so modern Hanukkiot have to have nine candles. So they have one for lighting and eight for the nights. Uh, and that's just an adaptation of the original. So they, they do have more candles. Uh, but that's like a side a side note. Um, the menorah is interesting because unlike the other temple artifacts, we do have records of its history after the destruction of the temple. Um, and we, we don't know where it is today uh, or if it still exists. And I have a feeling it was probably... And I'm not alone in this. A lot of historians, uh, I'll, I'll get to its probable destruction, actually. I won't spoil that yet. But basically, um, during the Second Temple period, we know that there was a menorah that filled the primary uh, role of indicating the sacred space in the Holy of Holies. Uh, we don't know of an Ark of the Covenant in the Second Temple period. That disappeared after the first, and it doesn't seem like uh, an original came back. The menorah might not have been the original either, but um, regardless, the menorah of the Second Temple period is the one that you hear about in the Hanukkah story. 
Um, and in the book of Maccabees, you'll find that the traditional story there is actually a little bit different than the one in first Maccabees. Um, but uh, this, this object's use continued until in the late 60s AD um, under the Roman Empire, uh, something happened to the temple, actually in 70 AD specifically, but a revolt broke out in the late 60s AD. Um, and this, this revolt called the Great Jewish War by historians generally, and we owe Josephus largely to our understanding of the details of it. He's a very fun historian to read. Um, in this revolt, uh, which supposedly, fun fact, broke out because, um, <laughs> broke out because a, a Roman soldier, like, mooned some Jews in the temple complex and the and a riot began and then this riot escalated wow with what a classy the, move <laughs> with the uh the sicarii the um the the zealots um who were essentially militant Jews who saw um uh independence as preferable to Roman rule and in, specifically independence achieved through violence um they rose up in revolt, and soon the whole uh, region was in revolt. Um, and so you have this this general who goes over there, and his name's Vespasian. Um, and if you know more about him, you might also associate him with the Flavian Amphitheater or the Colosseum in Rome. And the reason for this is because actually during the Jewish revolt, uh, the Emperor Nero dies by assisted suicide in a complex story that revolves a revolt of a guy with the fun name of Windex. But anyway, uh, Rome is left with a power vacancy and there are four different emperors in this time period before Ves Vespasian himself leaves the revolt to his son Titus and Vespasian becomes emperor and Titus essentially becomes heir to the empire. But Titus, while this is all going on, ends up uh, sieging the city of Jerusalem. Um, and during this siege, they the Romans break into different portions of the city one by one, and the zealots wall them off. But it's essentially a losing battle. Um, the The disorganized Jewish zealots are no match for the heavily organized Roman legions under the command of Titus. Um, and soon they get to the temple itself, and it's destroyed. The Romans were very particular about showing off their um, victories. The idea was that, um, you know, Roman hegemony should not be questioned, right? And if you are a powerful empire um, that has that sheer you know, force of violence behind you, the best way to make use of it is to show off that you can do it. And so taking back the most port important relics of the people that you defeat is a wonderful way to show who's boss. And so the menorah actually gets taken back to Rome and features in a triumph for Titus. And in fact, you can see a picture of this, ti this triumph. If you go to Rome, there is an arch of Titus it is neat. I think I've seen this image. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is amazing. I I was in Rome uh, last year and I nerded out all over this because I was like, yes, yes, yes. Um, but uh, essentially, it shows the menorah being carried in this triumph, uh, and we have historical records of it being in Rome and we even know where it got put. It got put in the temple of Pax, the embodiment of peace, uh, which is fun and ironic, but also shows you exactly what Romans thought peace meant, which was, you know, military to basically history. conquer your sacred sites and right. parade your sacred items for all right. to see. Um, it was a peace maintained by military force um, and hegemony, but yeah, the menorah actually stayed there, and it stayed there for a very long time. Um, when the Roman Empire Christianized in the early 300s, starting under uh, Constantine the Great, and um, 
like hitting its ultimate point under Theodosius the first. Uh, it essentially kept a lot of the old um, the old institutions associated with the Roman state. I think there's this common misconception that there was that like under Constantine there was a dramatic change in the nature of the Roman state uh, relative to religion. In reality, a lot of offices and a lot of institutions sort of continued, and they just gradually Christianized. Um, the through this transition, the the menorah remained in Rome, um, and we actually know this because uh, we know who took it next. So, um, in four fifty five. Uh, so the Roman Empire is on, wait, was this? No, 410 was the, was the Visigoths, 455 was the Vandals, right? So yes, it's the Vandals. Um, the Vandals, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, so excuse me if I, if I get minor. You're details. a braver man than I. I um, never go into dates without them in front of me. <laughs> uh, the Vandals, uh, who were a Germanic people who set up a kingdom in North Africa, they captured Roman North Africa and established um, Carthage as their capital. So once again, the Romans have an enemy, a seaborne enemy across the sea in the wonderful city of Carthage, a very classic situation. Um, and the Vandals become seagoing raiders. So they sack the city of Rome in 455, uh, which is the second sack within several decades because Alaric and the Visigoths had already done it. Um, and they, carried off a lot of what had been left by the Visigoths. And one of these was the menorahs. The menorah goes to Carthage. Um, and it is now a two-time victory trophy. It was a victory trophy of the Romans over the Jewish revolt. Now it is a victory trophy of the Vandals over the Romans. Do the Vandals have any idea of the original significance of the item? I think they did. They would have been Christianized at this point point i think aryan christians but i'm not entirely sure uh not that it particularly mattered to the average okay so they had some kind of context for it yeah they this was most of the germanic quote barbarians unquote that you hear about in this period have already been christianized uh once they're within the roman borders um it's their their portrayal is like foreign heathens is a bit like anachronistic they were people who were within the roman uh culture and military system very often um and they were part of a largely christian world order with pagans also still around um but anyway uh for like another century it remains in carthage and then um the Western Roman Empire falls in this time, but the Eastern Roman Empire still exists. And for uh, any bizaboos among us, you probably know what's about to happen next. Uh, in the 500s, Justinian the Great, um, or Justinian the First, not the gold nose one, the one that is in all the, like, every single history YouTube channels videos somewhere. Um, he decides to carry out what's called the Renovatio Imperi, which is the restoration of the empire um and justinian means this in a number of ways part of it is the uh restoration of like legal systems um and sort of a re-centralization and making sense of roman state systems that have fallen into uh into this sort of neglect but the other is territorial conquest. It is simply the idea that Rome used to rule the Mediterranean and it doesn't anymore, and that's a problem. And the first place that, that Justinian looks is the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. And so he sends his general Belisarius, uh, who I could, I could gush about for a while. He's fun. Um, to North Africa, and it wins this battle at the Battle of Ad Decimum. I don't remember the exact year. It's in the middle of 500s. Um, and following this battle, Carthage and North Africa are brought back into the Eastern Roman Empire. And uh, according to our most notable historian on the period, Procopius, um, 
the menorah itself is picked up and brought back to Constantinople. And it, it features in yet another triumph, uh, this time for Belisarius, who is the first person outside of a Roman imperial family to get a triumph in centuries. Um, and essentially, the, the menorah is now in Byzantine hands. And this is where it begins to get mysterious because I was going to ask, how is it, is it surviving well throughout these various conquests or is it being roughed up as it's brought from, from place to place? It's hard to say. So we don't have it now. That's, that's one of the things I should point out here. It doesn't exist in anywhere we know now. And that means that we are relying on historical depictions and written sources. So this is not an archeological discussion. This is a historical one. Um, but uh, it is now a three-time war trophy. Um, so uh, it's, it's going through a lot. This is the same object from the Hanukkah story, too. So uh, it's getting around. Um, but what happens to it next is a bit of a mystery. Uh, Procopius claims that it was actually sent to Jerusalem, which was still in... Uh, Byzantine hands at this point, because this is uh, about a century before the Arab conquests. Um, but we don't necessarily know about that because there aren't records of it being an object of pilgrimage there or uh, having arrived there. And so Procopius, who is a, a, a questionable narrator, I don't want to get too deep into that, but he seems to have some, um, he has some mixed views uh, potentially on a lot of the maybe the, a conflict of interest. Yeah, no, there's there's a document called the Secret History that might be written by him. It might not be that like is it's probably slander. It's probably just a slanderous work, but it's it's a great read. Um, and it basically <laughs> just depicts the emperor and his empress as like debauched monsters. But um, so one possibility is that it goes to Jerusalem. The other is that it possibly just stays in the imperial treasury in Constantinople. Um, either way, it probably left the Byzantine fold within the next century. And the reason for that is um, the Arab conquests happen in Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, under Omar ibn al-Khattab, uh, the... Uh, Rashidun Caliphate takes Jerusalem, um, and if that were the case, it would have been in Arab hands. Of course, they might have, they generally tolerated the Christian uh, presence there, and so um, it probably would have remained as an object there if that were the case undisturbed. We don't have any rel uh, reference to that, right? Um so it's hard to know if that was the case. If it remained in the Byzantine treasury, the question is, um, what, would it have been part of the constant giving of gold away to invaders within the next uh, few centuries of chaos when there are Sassanids, um, Bulgars, and Arabs uh, attacking the, the empire from, from all corners? Uh, because a number of times the treasury was just drained for the purpose of paying enemies to go away. I was I was going to say protection money, essentially, right? Yeah. That that's that's a rough situation. So you, you there may have been pressure to yield sacred relics uh, as a sort of protection payment, which of course is is only a temporary fix for a long term problem. Right, and this is this is. This is where my story like has an unsatisfactory ending. I cannot tell you how it ends, but this is there's a reason that it's my favorite like lost historical religious relic is the fact that this object, which was just like a votive candle holder for the Jewish temple, right? Uh, it becomes like a multi-time war trophy that represents all of the like late um or, or like military uh power shifts of late antiquity um 
as like, it is kind of funny how these various around. conquerors you know encounter this object but the the object's endurance seems to be the most you know until we lose track of it of course seems to be the most you know uh, interesting thing about about the story right. that you know conquerors come and go but this item uh just rides along with the changes mm -hmm. pretty much and then and then at some point it's just there it goes who knows <laughs> Well, so, you know, keep your eyes open for uh, a roughed up looking menorah with, was it six total candles? Seven. So there's one high Seven. one and then six on the like branches, as opposed to a Hanukkah today, which has eight on the branches. Yeah, I, I imagine that, you know, I, I think I've read too many stories about scrolls that have been found that some goat goes astray from its owner and they find a weird cave with with this relic in it. Uh, I'm sure that's not how it would go down if it were to be rediscovered. No. That, that's I, I hear you. I hear you talking about the the Qumran scrolls, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the original. Yeah, those are most of my yeah, yeah my discovery <laughs> stories. That's that's the goat one right there. Blame it on my goat. I really had very little to do with it. All right, so we're coming up on our time here, but I think I'd like to give our last question to to Andrew, if you can give us a, a little bit of a perspective here. So we talk sometimes about the dist the difference between you know more formalized theology that might come from the pulpit or a seminary school, uh, or or some you know authoritative person's decision, and more popular theology of how people practice and think of their faith, you know, day to day as as individuals. Do you think that to the average Catholic, you know, relics in general are a point of inspiration? Or do you think that for each Catholic, it comes down to, you know, what, if any, relics they've had an interaction with that that might be their inspiration? How, how are how are Catholics in today's day and time thinking of um, these these sacred relics, do you think? Yeah, I think it can vary greatly. Um... If I had to say a general feel, at least in what I would say, like northern U.S., western United States, those are kind of the two the two regions I've had the most time in. Um, since moving to the south, I haven't had much time to talk to people about relics. But the general consensus I get is um, there's a certain level of skepticism with older relics. Um, obviously, more modern ones that are very verifiable, I think people are are more willing to kind of accept. Um, so I, I think there's there's some skepticism around more traditional relics um, in at least now than there was in the past. I think there was a time when no one questioned, you know, if if the uh, if that crown in of thorns in uh, Paris was the crown of thorns or not. Um, I would imagine most modern Catholics would be skeptical as to the um, authenticity of it. However, I think that relics still do hold a place in Catholicism of they are something tactile that allows people to feel connected to a saint. Um, you know, I'm sure you can find people that are really devoted to relics and people that are could care less. But I think generally, at the very least, people think they are a cool way in which we can connect to our saints. Um, so I think they can still be an object for devotion. I think that they maybe did not, they don't, I don't think they play as prominent a role now as they have in the past, with the exception of if your church has a very strong tie to a specific saint and it has a relic of that saint. Um, I think of the half a dozen American canonized saints we have. Obviously, the churches where those saints are buried, the churches where those saints is, saints relics are held, um, they're very important for that community's identity. Um, but I, I would say that relics are not the most important thing, but I think people appreciate them. Um, I don't think people are going to spend time sitting in front, sitting with a relic, praying in the way they might do in Eucharistic adoration. And I think there was a time in Catholic history when that would happen. Um, but I think now they're more looked at as artifacts of our church history um, than than relics, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that perspective. 
Um, so we're, we're just about ready to close up here, but I want to give you guys one last chance if you want to give an elevator pitch for, for your podcasts or just remind us of, of what they are and, and where we can find them. Yeah, so I'll give a quick little pitch for potting through religion, and I'll just say, um, if you enjoyed Jacob and I conversing today about kind of the historic and theological dimensions of relics, you'll probably like potting through religion. Um, potting through religion is a podcast you can find on most of the major uh, podcast listening services, where Jacob and I spend about an hour every couple months just chatting about a theological and historical aspects of uh, a religious item, whether it be uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, mega churches, or science, the confluence of science and religion, the enlightenment. And yeah, uh, welcome. you're welcome to come listen in our conversation. Great. Thank you so much. So this has been the Dank Christian Memes podcast. Our music is provided by Olive Tiger. Uh, our Dank Christian Memes is a place for all kinds of Christians and all kinds of non-Christians to enjoy memes and fellowship. If you'd like to connect with our community further, we have some social links in the description. Uh, thank you for listening, and until next time, may the memes bless you and keep you.